Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to analyze the concept of asceticism from Christianity and Islamic perspective, in particular from the points of view of Jalaluddin Molana Rumi and Meister Eckhart. Both Rumi and Eckhart are powerful writers and eloquent speakers. One need only read Meister Eckhart's sermons and uh, Rumi's Divan Shams Tabrizi or Mathnavi in part to understand the complexity of their thought and their eloquence while they're expressing those thoughts. These two thinkers represent uh, two traditions, two sister traditions. So in this video, we are going to analyze Islamic and Christian mysticism. Sometimes in these two traditions, it is thought that uh, mysticism, in particular asceticism, ascetic practices and worldly detachment, have world-rejecting meaning in the sense that uh, for one to be a mystic, for one to do ascetic practices, to engage in worldly detachment, they need to separate themselves entirely and extremely and radically and go live in mountains or monasteries and not have a social life. The content of this video comes from a paper that uh, I have co-authored. So in this paper and in this video, I'm going to be examining whether from the perspective of Molana Jalaluddin Rumi and Meister Eckhart, asceticism is world rejecting or world affirming. That is, uh, do these thinkers believe and argue that the mystics should go and live on the mountains or should they be living in society? Beautiful poem, Rumi is saying that the world is like a trap in which the kings and the lions are stuck in mud up to their neck, not being able to free themselves. So when we look at this poem, does this mean uh, that Rumi is advocating a world-rejecting approach to asceticism? In another poem, Rumi says, Pirast arusa eshe dunya, margash talabi agar setani, the worldly bride that is the world itself. And the worldly bride is old. Marry her and soon you'll wish her dead. Does it again mean that we should be rejecting the world, distancing, distancing ourselves from it entirely? So in this video, my primary task is examining whether from the point of Rumi, asceticism and mysticism are world rejecting or world affirming. And secondarily, I will be examining the possible parallels and distinctions between these two great thinkers, between Rumi representing Islamic mysticism, Sufism, and Meister Eckhart representing Christian mysticism. I will provide the link for the paper in the description section so that you can read the paper yourself. But I will be analyzing the main points and arguments from that paper because of the technicality of the matter, I will be using a PowerPoint presentation. So without wasting any time, let's get into our analysis. Now, let's start our examination. The title of the paper that this video comes from is Rumi's Asceticism Explored a Comparative Glimpse into Meister Eckhart's Thought. As I told you before, I have linked the paper in description. So what are the objectives? The objective is examining the nature of asceticism or in Farsi Riyazat in Sufism, in Sufi perspective, especially from the point of view of uh, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi. Uh, there are two critical questions to be examined. Number one, is Rumi's asceticism or Riyazat world rejecting or world affirming? That is, in Rumi's perspective, that is, in Rumi's perspective, engaging in ascetic practices in worldly detachment force you to reject the world or still practice those while affirming the world number two what are the potential parallels and divergences between rumi and meister eckhart's stances so in this paper i have analyzed rumi's primary works uh, within the persian intellectual tradition um what do i mean by that and um, why have i done that well um considering like top three works by uh, Molana Rumi, that is Mathnavi, Divan Shams Tabrizi, and Fihem Afih. Let's say we are going to analyze this. Um, in the current literature, in, in works written in English, 
um, the majority of the works uh, use commentaries or explanations or quotations from the secondary sources within English language. As if Rumi was writing in English and the primary language was English, so those authors don't even bother to look at the Persian texts. Um, other than the text being in Persian and the delicacy and beauty can never ever be translated into any language, which is the case with any poet in the world in their mother tongue. Um, the, there is a wealth of the secondary sources in written and Farsi, and those who are writing in English completely ignore these books and just read from translations and quote from translations, quote from uh, sources that have read those translations and have written uh, based on those translations. So that's why my effort in this paper was to uh, contextualize Rumi's thought within the Persian intellectual tradition in the secondary sources. There are several critical themes in Rumi's works that we will be examining. Love, detachment or zohd in Farsi, the world's deceptive nature and seclusion. So the paper's thesis and this video's thesis is this. Rumi's asceticism is not monastic, rohbani in Farsi. Instead, it balances modern abstinence and worldly engagement underpinned by the Quran and the Hadith teachings. By Hadith, I mean the prophetic sayings, the prophetic narratives. Rumi and Eckhart underscore asceticism as an inner transformation rather than mere physical austerity. Rumi and Eckhart underscore asceticism as an inner transformation rather than mere physical austerity, emphasizing inner purification, self-transcendence, and spiritual detachment as roots to divine unity. The two thinkers' teachings are catalysts for profound personal transformation and a more fulfilling life in today's world. So this is, this is the thesis. Now, let's start with a biography from both thinkers. Maulana Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi Balkhi. He was born basically in Balkh Khorasan in the year 604 Hijri, that is 1207 CE. His father was Bahá'u'lláh Walad, a distinguished Sufi and scholar. Uh, so he comes from um, a scholarly family. The threatening Mongol invasion in 616 Hijri propelled his family into a nomadic state until they established residence in Konya. His father was a prestigious religious authority in Konya. After his death, Rumi inherited that position. Then he delved into Sufism. He became the student of uh, Burhan al-Din Firmizi, who was his father's student. He, now, the, here is the historic part happening. He met Shamsa Tabrizi, his life-changing mentor in 642-1244 CE. After a very short time, actually, um, in 645, Shams left him. And, and this, this meeting and his departure ref, left a historic effect on, uh, on Mola Narumi. Uh, the sun shone in my mouth. This is the effect of that historic meeting. And in another place, it says, Tabish Janyov Dilam, Vashod Abishkov Dilam. That is, my soul started radiating, started illuminating, and my heart opened up. This is the magnitude of the effects that Shamsa Tabrizi had on Rumi. After his departure, and actually during his meeting, Rumi withdrew from public sermonizing. Um, he focused on the spiritual training of disciples and his talks to, to his gatherings of his students. Uh, he died in 772-1273. Now the Christian mystic. Uh, Meister Eckhart was born around 1260, likely in Tombik, near Gotha in Saxony, eastern Germany, if I'm pronouncing all these names correctly. And he was a notable uh, medieval theologian, mystic, and philosopher. There is a debate whether he was uh, a philosopher, but if you want to see a discussion of that, uh, please refer to McGinn's book, The Mystical Thought of Meister Eckhart, The Man From Whom God Hid Nothing. So, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, in the introductory part of that book, uh, McGinn is dealing with this question. He was educated mainly at Studium General in Cologne. He advanced his studies uh, in Paris in the year 2086, and he, interestingly, he later became a professor 
at the University of Paris during uh, 1302, 1303. Meister Eckhart is one of the most controversial mystics of, I would say, all time. And uh, naturally, because of his radical thought, which could be compared to Ibn Arabi in Sufism, Eckhart's mystical teachings faced church scrutiny. So they were examining his works, trying to charge him of heresy. After his death in 1328, some of his ideas were condemned by the court in 1329. His substantial works, including including his Latin treaties and vernacular German sermons, markedly impacted Christian mysticism and philosophy. Again, his thought was so powerful and so penetrating that it affected Christian mysticism a lot. And uh, this, his significance, again, could be compared with Ibn Arabi, both of whom um, are speaking about a unity, which could be interpreted in a sense an absolute unity between the created and the creator, which is one of the most controversial theories. And Islamic jurists and Christian church do not like these expressions and these theories. Now, before going forward, I, I need to define some terms because these are the central terms and you need to have a good grasp of them. Um, first, in mysticism, the world affirming stance posits engagement with the world as beneficial or essential for spiritual practice when driven from otherworldly or transcendent motives. This view supports pursuing lawful sustenance and financial stability to uphold oneself and one's family, regarded as favorable for one's spiritual progression. It advocates for a balanced interaction with material and spiritual realms, suggesting that forsaking the material world is not requisite for spiritual advancement. The fulfillment from such balanced interactions aligns with the sought-after spiritual outcomes. So, uh, to summarize, uh, the world affirming stance in mysticism basically means you don't have to reject the world. You can have the world and your spiritual journey at the same time, but in a controlled way. Contrastingly, the world rejecting a stance interprets engagement with worldly desires and pleasures as detrimental, that is negative and harmful, especially those lacking transcendent significance. This viewpoint sees such engagement as injurious to individuals' spiritual health, potentially cultivating harmful traits like greed. It dissuades an undue emphasis on excessive worldly pleasures and desires devoid of a higher transcendent aspiration, recognizing it as an impediment to spiritual growth and inner transformation. Number three, escapist tendencies encourage radical disengagement from the material world, its difficulties and obligations to, to achieve spiritual objectives or maintain inner tranquility. This viewpoint perceives asceticism and mysticism as separate from the practical aspects of life and not actively contributing to social improvements or addressing real-life challenges. So, reject the world entirely, dwell in a place apart from people, and live your spiritual life. That is what escapist lifestyle and spirituality means. Now, the key term, monasticism. Monasticism denotes a religious practice where adherents commit to a strict seclusion, self-discipline, and spiritual dedication usually residing in purpose-built, isolated communities called monasteries. Now, these terms are very important in uh, what's going to follow, because these are the terms that I will be playing with during my presentation. And if you read the paper, they're going to happen on almost every page in that paper. Now, with this being said, let's start our discussion first about Rumi's understanding of asceticism, or like I said, in Farsi, Riyazat. So, um, the literal meaning. Uh, literally, riyazat or asceticism signifies the act of controlling animals and restraining their random movements while walking. That is what riyazat literally means. But uh, this is used in a technical sense. So, the analogy, the animal controlling analogy, implies that our animal faculty should remain subordinate to our rational faculty. Um, for philosophers, this should be a, a reminder of uh, Plato's thought that uh, we should uh, subordinate our other faculties to our rational faculty. 
this is important, I'm going to repeat that. The analogy implies that our animal faculty should remain subordinate to our rational faculty. Like the act of guiding animals, the rational faculty guides and tames the animalistic tendencies within humans, which, if left unchecked, may lead one spiritually astray. In this view, the rational faculty liberates humans from the desire-driven actions, resulting in harmony and tranquility within human faculties. Thus, asceticism does not necessarily and exclusively involve overwhelming physical hardships. This is very important. Asceticism in Islamic mysticism, unlike what some Sufis are doing, does not necessarily and exclusively involve overwhelming physical hardships. Instead, it entails the subordination of our animal faculty to the rational one, to direct the soul's faculties to the divine. Now, asceticism is a battle often referred to as Jihad al-Akbar in Arabic, in Farsi, Jihad al-Akbar, or the greatest struggle. A crucial transition point characterized as the new birth, voluntary death, echoing the prophetic saying, die before you die. And have in mind that this asceticism uh, in the Islamic thought derives from the balanced practices stipulated in the divine law, that is Sharia law, and tradition. And by tradition, I mean the Quran and the Hadith. Now, a comprehensive definition of asceticism considering all the things that we have discussed. Therefore, Islamic asceticism or riyazat is a deliberate and disciplined practice of self-restraint, abstaining from excessive material and sensual indulgences, and endurances of hardships to promote individual growth, self-mastery, and spiritual advancement. This practice is characterized by austerity in appearance, manner, and attitude. Notably, riyazat or asceticism encompasses resilience amid hardships and detachment, which I have translated as zohd in Farsi, worldly detachment, zohd, fostering spiritual growth. So, if you paid enough attention here, you would realize that Zohd is basically a part of Riyaza. That is, detachment is a part of asceticism. Some people directly translate Zohd as uh, asceticism, and that, that translation ignores this point, that, uh, that Zohd is actually a part of Riyaza. Zohd and Riyaza are two, are two interconnected concepts within Islamic spirituality, each with distinct nuances. Zohtar detachment emphasizes relinquishing worldly desires to pursue spiritual enlightenment and divine approval. Now, what are those nuances? Zoht or detachment emphasizes relinquishing worldly desires to pursue spiritual enlightenment and divine approval. So, relinquishing, letting go of, have that in your mind. On the other hand, Riyavet or asceticism embodies a disciplined practice of self-restraint, of austerity, enduring hardship, and zohd itself to promote self-mastery and spiritual growth. While Riyazat provides a broader framework for disciplined living, zohd is a vital component promoting detachment from worldly allurements. The practice of zohd supports the objectives of Riyazat by directing desires toward spiritual pursuits. Through Zohd, the disciplined lifestyle outlined by Riyaza is enriched, facilitating a balanced engagement with the worldly realm alongside a spiritually disciplined and detached stance. Harmoniously integrated, the two concepts guide individuals towards spiritual enlightenment and divine unity. So as you can see, uh, the, 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 this, there, is, there are distinctions between Zohd and Riyaza. Now, the concept of Riyaza has chronic roots. Uh, for example, in, the, uh, in verses 155-156 of chapter 2 in the Quran, um, God says, We will indeed test you with something of fear and hunger, the loss of wealth, souls, and fruits, and give glad tidings to those who, when affliction befalls them, say, Truly we are from God, and unto him we return. So, as you can see in these two verses, um, uh, we are tested with evil, and by evil I mean bad happenings, which is um, interestingly a concept, a, a discussion point in philosophy of religion today. And this verse should resonate with Christian mysticism and actually Christian theology, because uh, these two sister religions uh, see uh, riyazat, see asceticism, the difficulties in life as a test to advance spiritually. So here we have the difficulties listed, fear, 
let's say you, there is an earthquake, there is a flood, hunger, think about Africa, loss of wealth, you lose your money, somebody dies, your beloved one dies, or you lose your harvest, and all of these are to shake you off your guard, shake you off your balance, and there you're going to be tested. Everybody can be uh, performing well under normal circumstances, says God, basically. Let's see how you can handle, um, how you can walk on this path uh, during the hardships. And you need to be patient. Give glad tidings to those who, when affliction befalls them, say, truly we are from God and unto him we return. The words underscores lies trials and stresses, the significance of maintaining faith and gratitude amidst adversity. Now, uh, here is uh, one of the claims in this paper, and a right claim, I would argue, that uh, these, these two verses have colored Rumi's thought greatly. So Rumi stands towards the challenges, towards the difficulties in life, always echo these verses. So by incorporating Quranic teachings, Rumi portrays asceticism as an integral component of spirituality, spiritual development, and as a means to connect with the divine. Let's delve into Rumi's works to see uh, how we can spot those instances. So in Mathnawi, um, before, just let me give you a footnote here. Um, the, if you want to check the numbers, these letters, Roman letters, refer to the book number in Mathnawi. So this means Mathnawi, book 5, verses 3780 to uh, 3814. So in Mathnavi, Rumi portrays a spiritual journey from seeking glory and honor through physical suffering in battle or realizing to realizing that the true struggle lies in purifying the soul and overcoming the lower self. So here he gives us a story, and the message in that story is that, that like he's defining uh, a war and some people trying to like show boldness and courage in that in, in that war. The underlying message in that story is that true struggle lies not in your trying to find glory and honor in the physical battle, but in purifying the soul and overcoming the lower self. That is to say, your true honor in spirituality does not lie in physical difficulty, but it lies in inner purification, overcoming your lower self. That's why he called it Jahad Akbar or the great struggle. In the story, the journeyer embarks on ascetic lifestyle, embracing solitude, fasting, and self-discipline, emphasizing that the greatest struggle is the inner battle against one's self, ego, or nafs in Arabic and Persian. This spiritual practice allows the individual to focus solely on the divine and resist the temptations of the lower self. This story shows us that the sacrifices made in seclusion are solely for God, emphasizing the importance of sincerity in one's spiritual practices. Furthermore, Rumi contends that a genuine Sufi appreciates both the greatest struggle of purifying the self and the lesser struggle of physical battle, recognizing the significance of each in their spiritual journey through prioritizing the former struggle. So he's saying that uh, a, a gen genuine uh, spiritually oriented person should combine the great struggle that is inner purification with the physical with the uh, physical struggles, with going through physical hardships in their lives. In the book three of Mathnavi, Rumi encourages journeyers to willingly, to willingly embrace asceticism and commit their bodies to serve the soul. Practicing restraint can lead to deeper connection with the one's true self and foster spiritual development. And here is the uh, poem in Persian. He says, Pas riyazat ra be jan shol moshtari, shon sepor di tam be khidmat jan bari. Embrace asceticism with your soul, its seeker be. Once your body serves the soul, success you'll see. So, asceticism, he says, when imposed by God, that is, if you have some evil in your life that you haven't invited, and it's an affliction that basically came as part of your destiny, is a critical spiritual opportunity that contributes to one's overall spiritual growth. All in all, as a remembrance and as a reminiscent of the Quranic verses cited before, suffering and challenges play a pivotal role in Rumi's thought. Uh, he says, look, uh, suffering increases your sp speed in your spiritual path, and you should be, uh, you should be inviting it willingly. 
interestingly in Ivan Hashem's Tabrizi in Ghazal 1372 line 16 he says that he has given sweet lives to buy afflictions Satjan shirin dadam ta in bala bkhridam I have given my desires in inviting this hardship meaning that I have welcomed suffering because it is spiritually nurturing me Rumi's profound and irremediable suffering revolves around the themes of loss, estrangement, alienation, and separation. This suffering is being separated from the beloved, that is God, and confined within the physical realm, a natural consequence of being separated from perfection and having to tolerate its absence. So if you read Masnavi, uh, the, the first few lines, um, the story says this, listen to this nay nay the musical instrument that is complaining that is shouting out about separation so from the first moment of this book he starts talking about separation um well in islamic metaphysics sufism humans uh, were in unity with god in the divine essence so uh, in creation uh, the, the, the the essential manifestation came in so through essential manifestation, then through the manifestation of names and qualities, all these individualizations brought about the created beings, the finite beings. So we were separated from the divine essence. We are separated from, to put it in Plotinus's words, from the fatherland, from home. And we are apart from that home. That's why Rumi is suffering. Rumi finds no rest in this suffering, that, saying that he will never ever be at peace while he is apart from the friend. Now, in one of the interesting lines in uh, in Divan Shams Tabrizi, he he acknowledges that the path to spirituality, to spiritual perfection, is challenging. It requires commitment and uh, a nimble traveler who will not easily be discouraged by the obstacles they encounter. There is a very elegant point that those who read and understand Persian would understand better from just the translation that I'm going to give you. Outlining these qualities, saying that, look, in this path, you should be fast, you should be stubborn, you should be strong, you should be smart, you should be tolerating hardships, and such and such. But this trait is for a nimble traveler, agile and bold. You, the world's sweetheart, where could you ever uphold? The elegance in this poem is just fascinating. Rumi is saying that if you are a spoiled brat, well, in my interpretation, if you are a spoiled brat, uh, this is not the path for you. You cannot handle it. How, how, how do you, you are the world's sweetheart. How can you handle the difficulty in this path? Conclusion. While Rumi acknowledges the challenges associated with asceticism, he emphasizes its transformative power in purifying the soul and overcoming, the, and overcoming the lower self. Rumi's interpretation of asceticism entails a purposeful, methodical, and world-affirming approach to self-control, refraining from overindulgence in material and sensory pleasures, and tolerating adversities to foster personal and spiritual growth. Now, then Rumi introduces a very powerful element that is Rumi's signature, I would argue, and that is love, mystic love, divine love, a powerful element alleviating the ascetic practices, challenges, transforming them into delighted experiences. Throughout his works, Rumi is always saying, look, there are difficulties, it is a difficult path, but there is this element, there is this mystic love that makes all these challenges so sweet for him. So it is the divine love that is pulling Rumi from the material world to the spiritual path, making him tolerate the difficulties of this path. Um, uh, they, they, they love mysticism, they love metaphysics, whatever you call it, um, what was present in the works of other authors, other poets, mystics before Rumi too, but um, this the metaphysics of love reached its apex with with Molana Rumi, and uh, interestingly, for those of you who are interested in uh, love mysticism, I would encourage you to read about Mullah Mohsen Feza Kashani, who was a student of uh, basically Mullah Sadra, and his poetry, which has been largely ignored in Western philosophical and mystical literature, is rife 
with mystic love, with divine love. Uh, we are writing some papers, so uh, I will be creating videos about those too. But in the meantime, I encourage you to get to read about uh, Mullah Muslim Feza Kashani. If honestly, I, I take several poems from Feza Kashani and several poems from Rumi, I don't tell you which one is from Rumi, which one is from Faith. They wouldn't even recognize them. But in any case, that was just a detour. Let's get into love's role in Sufism. Uh, in Maqalat, Rumi's mentor, Shamsa Tabrizi, writes this strange and powerful passage. He says, he, God, is self-sufficient. You must express your need to him. For the self-sufficient loves the needy, loves the person in need. Through that need, something from the eternal God would be bestowed on you, which is love. Pay attention. Through that need, something from the eternal would be bestowed on you, which is love. Through that eternal, that is through that love, you perceive the eternal, the God. To paraphrase this last strange but powerful sentence, through love, you perceive God. Through love, you perceive God. How can this happen? We're going to examine that. To understand Shams Tabrizi's assertion, we need to delve into secondary sources a little bit. Jalaluddin Homoyi, which was um, a magnificent Rumi scholar, an Iranian Rumi scholar, says, Love is the sustaining force behind the cosmos and the essential link within the chain of beings. Its absence, that is love's absence, could rupture this interconnected structure. What does he mean by that? To understand this better, like to understand why he's saying that love is a sustaining force behind the cosmos, we need to be familiar with, uh, with a concept called Vahdat al-Wujud or unity of existence or the oneness of being. I, I cannot get into it so deeply in this video, but there, are, there, there is a separate video for that from Ibn Arabi's perspective, which I will link in the description. Watch that if you, if you wish. But this summary is this, according to this theory, through his manifestation, the real God pervades the world, culminating in a singular existence. There is only one existence, there is only one reality, and all the finite beings, all the finite entities are nothing but emanations, manifestations of that single reality. There are different interpretations of the theory. Again, I cannot open them up here. Um, like there are those who are saying, no, there is no unity of existence. There is unity in contemplation. That is not that existence is one. There are there is a real existence, and there are created existences, and there is there are other interpretations of the theory. But the most radical one usually ascribed to Ibn Arabi says that no there is absolute unity of existence that there is nothing but the real in the sense that even the created beings are part part in quotation marks part of the real so when you get to a high spiritual level you unite with the divine essence you you you, you, you when your chains shackle when you free yourself from your material constraints you reach a point that all these limitations go away and unite in an absolute sense in the divine essence. But it has its own criticisms, but I'm not going to get into those here. Um, to understand how uh, this divine love, this mystical love, um, connects with the unity of existence, we need to understand a modification of this theory uh, done by the uh, famous Iranian philosopher Mullah Sadra. Uh, Mullah Sadr Shirazi and his famous gradational unity of existence. This unity views existence as an interconnected hierarchical reality with diverse instances or existence. What it means is that he takes Ibn Arabi's unity, he says, look, yes, there is unity in existence, but we don't have to deny all the multiplicity in the world to prove that to prove that uh, unity. There is unity in multiplicity, a multiplicity in unity. To understand that, he introduces a new kind of multiplicity. Let's examine that. So according to him, there are two multiplicities. Horizontal multiplicity denotes diverse existence with unique attributes within the same existential plane. Vertical multiplicity 
entails different existential ranks marked but varying degrees of perfection. So here in the first horizontal multiplicity there, there is animal, like same existential plane. But which animal? There are different kinds of animals in the same existential plane. But in the vertical multiplicity there were different existential planes, different existential ranks marked by varying degrees of perfection. One being higher than the other, the ranks extend from the pinnacle of the essentially necessary to the lowest level of existence, i.e. the prime matter, each level exhibiting a unique blend of constraints and perfections. So if you consider from the prime matter moving towards the apex, that is the essentially necessary, there are different existential ranks, one being higher than the other. So there is a vertical multiplicity, a vertical hierarchy, and horizontal multiplicity. Building on this, Yasravi says, by mirroring existence's diverse ranks, love too possess possesses different levels, from the love for the lower levels of existence to the love for the essentially necessary. Why do existence have love for the higher levels? Each existence pursues the higher levels perfection. So that is the cause behind the love for the, uh, for, for the higher levels. Love for the essentially necessary is deemed as the real love, and that for the created existence is classified as the metaphorical love. The real love's force stimulates metaphorical love, and pursuing metaphorical love can lead to attaining the real love, if one consciously seeks the real love reflected in, in these metaphorical mirrors. So in this perspective, uh, because um, humans are to love all the existence, existential ranks because they are basically manifestations of the divine, manifestations of God, and you are to love all these manifestations, even your worldly loves, you, know, you love a man or a woman in your life, in your earthly life. If you consciously seek the real love, even within that romantic love, that's going to take you to God, that's going to take you to the real love, reflected in the metaphorical mirror in, in your spouse's love that you're experiencing. So this perspective illuminates Shams Tabrizi's assertion in Maqalat that we started this section with, through love you perceive God. Rumi usually and repeatedly refers to love as a cure for suffering and challenges. In Divan Shams Tabrizi, in Ghazal 1372, line 10, he writes, But if love's pain should conquer you, with this pain the sorrow of the heart you can cure. In Fiha Mafi, which is another famous work from Rumi, he says, Love seekers must strive for an inner illumination, which follows asceticism to achieve tranquility and liberation from worldly desires. In such people's heart, contrary to the materially oriented individuals, worldly temptations appear as fleeting desires, never settling. The path to true spiritual understanding is long and demanding, yet it can be traversed through the transformative power of love. Let us conclude the love section for Rumi. Therefore, to Rumi, love propels the spiritual journey and lightens its challenges underscoring love's role as the driving force behind the seeker's journey, and asceticism as the tool for transcending one's lower self. The aim of this journey is not self-denial per se, but rather self-transcendence, leading to divine unity through love and asceticism. So love couples with asceticism, leading you to divine unity and self-transcendence. Let us examine another central theme, another central term in this examination. That is detachment or zot, which is a crucial concept to Rumi's asceticism. Definition. Zot in Farsi and Arabic literally means to become uninterested, to turn away from something, to abandon the world, and to renounce the worldly desires. But in Islamic spirituality, Zuhd is detachment from worldly pleasures to pursue spiritual pleasures and God's approval. In Mathnavi, Book 6, Rumi stresses Zuhd's transformative power and potential in facilitating spiritual enlightenment through wisdom and connecting with the divine by pointing to the relationship between detachment and ma'arifa or knowledge in Farsi ma'arifat. In this context, Rumi associates the soul of religious law and piety with the arif, 
implying that adherence to religious tenets is crucial for comprehending spirituality. This connection demonstrates Rumi's assumption that Zohd is rooted in principles derived from the Quran and Hadith, emphasizing the importance of adhering to both religious tenets and spiritual exploration. This negates many attempts in the literature who try to, to like demonstrate Rumi as just a, a monastic mystic, ignoring the religious tenets altogether, just intoxicated by love, smelling flowers, and that was not the case. Yes, he was having spiritual exploration, but he was also a practitioner of religious tenets. Um, this is not what the Hollywoody literature is trying to show today. Any case, therefore, Rumi's equal emphasis on both spiritual and rel religious dimensions reinforces this paper's assertion that his mystical teachings, while advocating for Zoft, affirms worldly engagement. So, world plus spirituality. That is what Rumi's Zoft means. Among many themes, the significance of um, the world's deceptive nature for Rumi relates to his view of detachment and asceticism. We need to examine this. For example, he considered the world to be of little significance. In Mathnavi, Book 6, line 1640, he likens the world to a mosquito's wing. That is insignificant. In Divan Shams Tabrizi, uh, he likens the world to a harlot adorned with rosy veil emphasizing its deceptive appearance. Don't gaze at her ankle. Behold her dark leg. That is, don't look at that harlot's ankle. That is, don't look at the beauty of the world. Behold her dark leg. Look how dark and occupying the world is. Don't just be fascinated by the superficial beauty of the world. See the reality behind. Night play is delightful, yet behind the curtain. Wash your hands off her, O righteous Sufi. Detach your heart from her, O man of steadfast strength. This is why Rumi urges spiritual travelers to detach from the material world and prepare their hearts for spirituality instead. Notably, while Rumi advocates for worldly detachment, this is important, his mysticism inherently holds a world-forming stance. He advocates a balanced engagement with life's material and spiritual dimensions, negating the necessity to forsake the material world solely for the spiritual development or excessively delving into the worldly affairs. In a fascinating poem in Divan, in Ghazal 2757, he says, The bride of the world's feast is old. Marry her, and soon you'll wish her dead. In Mathnawi, Book 4, he likens the world to an old sorcerer who casts spells on its inhabitants, captivating and leading them astray from their true path. In Divan, Ghazal 2028, he says, A snare is this worldly trap, where kings and lions, representing even the strongest human beings, like dogs, remained in carrion up to their necks. Damis torfe tarzin kez vey fetade bini bi aql ta be kaabo hoshyar ta be gerdan. A trape is stronger than this where you can see. The senseless to their ankle, the wise up to their neck. Here Rumi is uh, painting a paradoxical picture. He says the world is a strange trap. The senseless to it, that is those who are indifferent to the world, are trapped in it up to their ankle, that is, to a minimum degree. But those who are conscious to it, that, that means those who are occupied by the world, are trapped in it up to their necks. A fascinating poem indeed. Now, a summary of the world's nature in Rumi's thought. Rumi's portrayal of the world as deceptive shapes his thought and asceticism. He sees the world as misleading veil that distracts individuals from pursuing divine wisdom. This insight promotes the philosophy of Zoht, a deliberate detachment from the earthly enticements central to Rumi's asceticism, which advocates self-discipline and temperance in material and sensual endeavors. Consequently, by advocating separation from the illusory world, Rumi's doctrine defines asceticism as a path of transformation. This journey, guided by love and lit by the divine light, 
ultimately leads to unity with the divine. In the beginning, uh, in the thesis, I claimed that Rumi's mysticism, asceticism, is not monastic. Let's examine that. According to Rumi, it is not the world itself that is evil, but humans' excessive preoccupation with it. Um, to understand this, let us examine a passage from Naraqi, uh, Mullah Ahmad Naraqi, in his Mi'raj al Sa'ada. He distinguishes two types of engagement with the world one that is praised and the other that is condemned. The motivating factor behind the praised engagement is otherworldly. That is, you engage with the world not for the sake of the world itself, but for a, for a transcendental and otherworldly purpose. So in this world, let's say you're working to provide for your family to, let's say, satisfy um, God's happiness, to satisfy your family's happiness with this transcendental mentality. You're working to earn money to help the poor. With such mentality, even finances contribute to your spirituality. And this aligns with, uh, with the hadith, with the narrative from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He says, worship consists of 70 parts, the highest of which is seeking lawful sustenance. So again, finances in this mentality and in this context contribute to spirituality. This is praised engagement with the world. The other type, the condemned engagement with the world. Here, the person is preoccupied with the designers and worldly pleasures that are not otherworldly. Are, that are not transcendental. This leads to an ill heart fostering harmful attributes like greed. Here, with this condemned preoccupation, you are obsessed with the material world for itself and in itself, excessively dealing, let's say, with the luxurious aspects of life, delving into your uh, desires, trying to satisfy them. Rumi's engagement with the world, as we can see from his work, um, fits into the first type, fits into the praised engagement with the world. Despite discussing abstract and intuitive matters, Rumi's language also includes social and civic matters, which shows that he considers the worldly life important too. He suggests a harmonious balance between life's material and spiritual aspects, which I have been repeating throughout this presentation. This approach aligns with Islam's emphasis on living within the medium path. Those who are familiar with ancient Greek philosophy and the Nicomachean ethics, Aristotle introduces this medium path discussion. He says there are two extremes in everything. And your job, if you want to live a moral, ethical life, is to find the medium path and live through it. And well, in Islamic philosophy of ethics, they take this they, they take this mentality and introduce that middle path as, as the Sharia law, as the divine law. He says, look, the divine law is that medium path. So Rumi's stance, despite what many people are trying to portray him as some excessive and radical Sufis, as I have been showing from his work directly quoting with the references, his path is not that of a radical Sufi, a monastic Sufi. His path is that of a medium path, a harmonious balance of material and spiritual life, which is one of the reasons that he has become so universal, surviving centuries after his death. Let us substantiate this claim a bit more. In Fiha Mafi, in his other famous work, Rumi first quotes Prophet Muhammad's uh, famous saying that Islam does not endorse monasticism. He writes, God revealed to the Prophet a path more demanding than monasticism, which encompasses marriage and tolerance of marital difficulty. The Prophet said, God showed me a harder path than monasticism, the challenges associated with the monastic lifestyle, and that more difficult path is marriage and the tolerance of marital difficulties. You have to provide for your family, you have to work, you have to earn money, you have to cope with the possible misbehavior of your husband or your wife. And this is spiritually fulfilling, spiritually nurturing. Demonstrating patience over such difficulties purifies one's character, says Rumi. Your spouse is a means for self-cleansing and self-improvement and vice versa, and you for him or her. This is a fascinating picture that paints even your marital life as a 
spiritual path. Then he adds, but the path of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, focuses on the solitary struggle and resisting lust. And he acknowledges that. Interestingly, he does not deny this. He says, if you look, pay attention to this sentence. If you cannot follow the Prophet Muhammad's path, at least pursue the Prophet Jesus' path. See, at least pursue the Prophet Jesus' path, so as not to be utterly deprived. He prioritizes, of course, the former path, but he says, if you cannot do that, fine, at least go with the, uh, with the latter path. Now, there is a very important discussion about solitude. Uh, that is too much for me to discuss in this presentation. Please read the paper, pages 9 to 10. Here, I'm examining what role solitude played in Rumi's asceticism. But let me just give you a summary here. There are two camps. One of the camps, again, as a, a monastic camp, says that you have to live in mountains apart from societies in uh, monasteries and not associate yourself with a society. The other camp says, no, you have to live in society and have your spirituality. Rumi fits into the second camp. How, why, through which lines, which books, and through what lines of reasoning, please refer to pages 9 to 10. Now let us get to Christian mysticism and its representative Meister Eckhart. Meister Eckhart's asceticism centrally revolves around detachment. Detachment is a very important word for uh, Meister Eckhart. Detachment for Eckhart has dual implications. Number one, the renunciation of earthly pleasures for spiritual fulfillment and God's approval. So this is what we have been discussing in Rumi's thought, right? So you have to um, detach yourself from the excessive worldly pleasures to achieve something spiritual and achieve God's satisfaction and progress in your spiritual journey. That is one side. The other side has a more technical meaning. Detachment in this meaning refers to human's intellect capacity to dissociate itself from world finite created entities, including its existence, including human's existence. That is important. We're going to dwell on that. But uh, let's start with uh, substantiating detachment type one. I'm going to examine Eckhart's thoughts through his treaties and sermons, mostly. On the treaties called On Detachment, Eckhart points to the indispensable role of suffering in one's spiritual progression. According to him, the requisite detachment for spiritual ascent is most proficiently attained through suffering. He deems it as the quickest pathway to divine perfection. And he makes this point by pointing to individuals who embrace the utmost bitterness alongside Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, who will subsequently experience the greatest eternal bliss. The card says suffering may affect the body, but it beatifies the soul in the divine sight. This is a direct quote from him, from his sermons, Sermon 8. If you suffer for God and God alone, your suffering does not hurt and is not hard to bear, for God bears the load. Another quote from Sermon 83. Truly, it is in the darkest that one finds divine light. So when we are in sorrow and distress, then this light is nearest of all to us. This articulates that our suffering is transformed into divine light, and that light is brightest in the darkest of moments. That is, that light, divine light, is present in the most difficult and challenging of the circumstances. You see how this echoes, how this resonates with Rumi's thought and with the chronic passage I quoted in the beginning, that suffering is a means, but it gifts you spiritually. Now, let us get into the second meaning of detachment. In the treatise on detachment, Eckhart depicts detachment as void of earthly desires, paving the way for divine will to inhibit the heart. That is important, paving the way for divine will to inhibit the heart. It's like a race towards divine unification, where the detached heart, open for divine imprinting, attains the highest state of blessedness. In another treatise, i.e. the talks of instruction, the part on detachment and on possessing God, Eckhart illustrate detachment as an internal state rather than mere physical seclusion. Again, a very 
highlighted similarity with Rumi. This is going to be a very surprising passage. Eckhart criticizes the superficial peace in solitude, proposing that a person in the right state can achieve equanimity anywhere. A truly detached person possesses God, unhindered by location, task, or company. You see, this directly rejects his uh, monastic orientation, uh, unlike some Christian or Sufi monastic mystics who believed in secluding themselves in uh, some physical purpose-built places. He's saying, look, that, that is of no use if you don't have that, if you're not in the right state. If you are in the right state, you possess God within you, anywhere you are, in society or not. But if you do not have that right state, it doesn't matter whether you're living in uh, monasteries or not. You don't have it. You don't have God with you. Therefore, Eckhart deviates from the usual monastic approach in Christian mysticism. I think his softer, more social approach to spirituality um, seems influenced by his philosophical orientation. He, if you just study his works, you will see that, yes, he's a mystic, but he is philosophically oriented. And I think this more rational social aspect of Eckhart stems from that philosophical orientation. In Of Diligence, we see that detachment involves continuous self-renunciation. Again, a reminder of Rumi's mysticism, to align one's will with the divine. You see, divine will plays a bolder role, a, high, a more highlighted role in Eckhart than Rumi. Not that it doesn't ring a bell in Rumi, it does, but it's just more highlighted in Eckhart's uh, expressions. Detachment involves continuous self-renunciation to align one's will with the divine. This constant process of self-emptying transforms the self to receive God's presence. This is important, to receive God's presence entirely. And this word entirely is one of the instances that uh, makes some people think that Eckhart's expressions are too radical. Receive God's presence entirely. There will be more examples of that. Now, uh, the great Eckhart scholar McGinn expounds on the relationship between detachment and two other critical elements in Eckhart's metaphysics, birthing and breaking through. Birthing, according to McGinn, in Eckhart's thought, symbolizes divine words manifestation within the individual, which follows detachment and involves relinquishing possessiveness, ego, and will. Now the second concept, breaking through, follows birthing. It goes beyond recognizing God as the creator. Recognizing, this is important, it goes beyond recognizing knowledge, knowledge alone. It goes beyond recognizing God as the creator to realizing divine unity. Upon breaking through, the individual exists beyond all created things. A very important assertion. No longer simply God's creation, but part of divine unity. At, at the beginning, I told you that Eckhart and Ibn Arabi are very similar. These are some of the instances that substantiate that claim. Here, both, um, not just with this example, but with many examples that we will see and you can see while reading uh, Eckhart and Ibn Arabi, you will understand that they are painting an absolute unity in the spiritual path. And that's why why some people have criticized both these thinkers, including the church and including some Islamic jurists. Now comes Eckhart's famous metaphor, the desert metaphor. He represents the desert as a state of emptiness, devoid of everything material or spiritual. The end point of detachment, birthing and breaking through, where the soul transcends mere comprehension of God to complete union with him. Again, two points. Number one, he transcends comprehension, understanding, knowledge of God to an experiential unity with God. But again, here is a second aspect, a second point that makes Eckhart radical to some people. Complete union with him. Complete union with God. Dobby, another Eckhart scholar, examines the relationship between detachment and intellectual abstraction. And this is a very, very fine point that Dobby has illustrated in his work Logos and Revelation, where he compares uh, Ibn Arabi and Meister Eckhart. 
he posits two types of abstractions within the human intellect. The first involves the intellect's capacity to abstract forms from sensible substances. The second, more important and more Eckhartian one, which Eckhart calls detachment, goes further. Detachment, in this sense, involves the intellect's capacity to separate itself from all finite created beings, including its existence as a creature to fully conform, fully, again, may sound radical to some people, to fully conform to existence itself or to the absolute being. In the second abstraction, while maintaining its creaturely attributes outwardly, the soul remains intellectually active, comprehending existence as such. It is devoid of any particular mode, thus enabling the reception of God without any form. If I don't inform uh, an Ibn Arabi scholar that this text is from Eckhart, they wouldn't even recognize that it's whether from Eckhart or Ibn Arabi, especially the last part, enabling the reception of God without any form. What is love's role in Eckhart's thought, in Eckhart's mysticism? In Sermon 16, uh, with, we see Eckhart saying that love dictates one's adherence to divine will and forsaking of self-interest. This love, reaching its peak when contradicting God's will becomes unthinkable. When contradicting God's will becomes unthinkable. This love derives asceticism, urging the abandonment of worldly desires to seek the divine unity. Furthermore, the epics of this detachment for Eckhart is seeking nothing for oneself and performing all acts out of love, the example of which we will see down here. Consequently, love for God propels detachment, guiding individuals towards self-surrender and divine union. Now, this is a, a direct quote from uh, Eckhart's sermons. This is honestly one of the most attractive passages that I've ever seen. And frankly, this is one of the passages that uh, attracted me, uh, a Muslim scholar in Islamic mysticism, towards Christian mysticism and Eckhart's and Eckhart scholarship. In Sermon 16, Eckhart writes, He who has abandoned self and all things, who seeks not his own in anything, and does all he does without why and in love, that man being dead to all the world, is alive in God and God in him. That is just magnificent. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage. And I don't need to tell you how much it resonates with Rumi's thought and Islamic metaphysics. With this being said, let's compare Rumi and Eckhart's views more extensively. Um, a general statement. Their notable agreement on spiritual purification and inner transcendence, juxtaposed with the distinct cultural philosophical expressions, enriches the comprehension of divine unity pursued. That being said, let's get into a point-by-point -point analysis. Let's first start with Rumi and Eckhart's shared beliefs. For both of them, the lower self should yield to the inner self via asceticism. Asceticism is a spiritual purification for both of them through renunciating earthly desires. Again, for both of them, true asceticism involves not just physical austerity, but also a profound soul transformation and ego renunciation. The ultimate goal is divine unity. Detachment from worldly pleasures and personal will is fundamental in their approach to asceticism. Love for both of them is a pivot, pivotal element serving as a catalyst in a spiritual journey and promoting self-transcendence. Love is the key for self-transcendence in both these mystics' thought. Suffering for both of them is perceived as a medium for spiritual growth. Both mystics view love as the central force guiding the soul towards the white union. Concepts like Eckhart's breaking through and Rumi's annihilation in God or Fanaifillah illustrate the path towards realizing divine unity. A meaningful life is depicted as attainable through a spiritual journey centered of love, centered on love and detachment, with the aim of achieving divine union. Now, some differences uh, between the two thinkers. Rumi and Eckhart's teachings are shaped by their, uh, of course, varied traditional, religious, geographical, and cultural context. With that being said, while Eckhart 
uses philosophical discourse, Rumi employs metaphorical and poetic vocabulary, making his, i.e. Rumi, making his depiction of God appear more personal and more accessible. Rumi's teachings, perhaps due to their narrative and poetic nature, might appeal to a broader audience, whereas Eckhart's intellectual discourse might appeal more to an intellectually trained audience. Furthermore, Rumi emphasizes the need for a spiritual mentor, which is less accentuated in Eckhart's teaching. I'm not saying that it's not there, I'm saying that in Rumi's thought it is more highlighted, which goes back to Sufism's general framework and emphasis on a spiritual mentor or sheikh. Now, how can the two thinkers' thought uh, enrich each other? Rumi's emotive and metaphorical approach provides a compassionate balance to Eckhart's more intellectual and philosophical discourse. On the other hand, Eckhart can add depth and clarity to Rumi's metaphorical explanations through his philosophical discourse. Concepts like Eckhart's birthing and breaking through and Rumi's annihilation and subsistence with God, fanaifillah and baqaibillah, are complementary, offering an enriched depiction of the spiritual journey. What is the conclusion? The conclusion is this. Rumi and Eckhart, although emerging from divergent traditions and cultures, both, both advocate for an asceticism focused on inner transformation and spiritual purification, transcending mere physical austerity. Their teachings converge on love's transformative power, guiding individuals toward spiritual enlightenment and divine unity, despite different modes of expression, poetry and philosophical discourse, respectively. Furthermore, their teachings invite universal access to spiritual quests, transcending specific religious and cultural frameworks and offering an inclusive, nuanced narrative that embraces varied spiritual pathways towards a deeper understanding and connection with the divine. Now, these two thinkers' thought have helped me so much, and this research was mm, literally the most nurturing, the most satisfying one for me. And I enjoyed a lot in my readings, in my research, which took a long time. And I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. You enjoyed the content of these two thinkers' thought. And I hope this research could shed some light on both Islamic and Christian mysticism. And more importantly, I hope that this research helped you understand and hopefully practice a more meaningful life. That is to say, I hope this research gave depth to a more meaningful life. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please like and share to help the channel. Looking forward to having you in my next videos. Be well.